Welcome back. And now the story of a young girl who loved her father with all her heart. It's a love he continues to feel every day of his life, even though she is no longer in it. And it's a love that will surely touch your heart as well. Chet Zuber and his wife Jean live on a Christmas tree farm in northern Michigan, and together they raised a family of six children. But just before their youngest was born, Chet began experiencing serious health problems, and at the age of 35, he had his first heart attack. My whole world collapsed down around me. And all of a sudden, I got one foot in the grave and the other one on a banana peel, and at that time, if you live 10 years after a heart attack, that's... You were doing pretty good. He kept getting weaker, and um, you know it was hard for him to come up the basement stairs. He couldn't go for a long walk. Chet was diagnosed with advanced arteriosclerosis. He had the heart of a 70-year-old. Over the next 15 years, he would suffer several more heart attacks and endure three coronary bypass operations. In 1987, when I had the third bypass surgery, and during the third surgery, I had a massive heart attack. And I never recovered from that. Chet's poor health forced him to retire from his job in sales. Now home full time, he was finally able to develop deep relationships with his children. He became especially close to his youngest daughter, Patty. <laughs> you can let her hold a baby looking like that? For the record, Patty and I got along quite well. Do it again. <laughs> She was a joy to have her on. And she was deeply concerned about her father's condition. She sent me a Father's Day card that says, if I had my way, I'd buy you the biggest automobile, uh, the biggest TV. And then she drew in, in her own handwriting, a picture of a new healthy heart. And it was an emotional thing for me. I, I thought that was so sweet. Patty's concern led her to an interest in the medical field, and eventually she became a state-certified medical assistant. At about the same time, Chet's doctor placed him on the heart transplant list. He says, don't get your hopes up high. He says, the organs are very scarce. But he says, that's the only chance you've got. I had so much heart damage by that time that there was nothing left to work with. We live close to Beaumont Hospital. I knew that they brought these hearts in by helicopter. I heard every helicopter, I swear, for four years, day and night. It was this long and painful wait that may have inspired Patty to make a very personal decision. We were sitting down at dinner, and as we were passing food around a table, she just casually mentioned she'd stop and fill out her organ donor card that day. And I thought, gee, that's nice. And I never thought about it again. Patty's interest in medicine intensified. And in 1994, she enrolled in some nursing classes at a local college. But before school began, she decided to join a friend on a camping trip to the Great Smoky Mountains in Tennessee. It would prove to be a fateful decision. In the wee hours of the morning on August 18th, the car Patty was riding in was involved in a horrible crash. A short while later, her parents were awakened with the tragic news. On the other end of the line was the doctor from the trauma unit at the University of Tennessee Medical Center telling me that Patty's injuries were severe. He says, don't even bother coming down as death appears to be but moments away. And we were both in shock, disbelief. We felt helpless. Here you have a child dying 700 miles away and there's nothing you can do. I was just like stunned. I just, I couldn't believe it. and. He got up and he said, you know, he said, Patty had said, you know, she'd signed her donor card. Should I call them back and let them know that? And I said, yes. So I called the hospital back. I got a hold of the same doctor and I says, doctor, I says, you do everything you can to save this child's life. But if things don't work out, it was Patty's wish to be an organ donor. The next day, Patty was still alive, but on life support. Her parents flew to the University of Tennessee Medical Center to be near her. And Patty was laying there on a the monitor. I could see that her heart was beating. 
I could see her chest move. She was breathing, although with a native respirator. So I thought, maybe, just maybe, the doctors were wrong, and, and, and Patty's going to recover from this. But sadly, that was not meant to be. And two days later, a neurologist pronounced Patty Zuber brain dead. Everything was over. All our hopes, our prayers, our wishes uh, didn't work out. But the Zubers could still honor Patty's last wishes. And so they met with Susan Friedenberg Cross of the Tennessee Organ Donor Services. I would guess in Mr. and Mrs. Zuber's life that that was the worst day that they have experienced. And for them to consider transplanting organs to other people they've never met is just a completely altruistic gift. Susan had learned that Chet was waiting for a heart transplant, but said nothing. It was very clear to me that we were not there to talk about him receiving Patty's heart. This was a family who wanted to help other people, and they were not thinking about themselves at all. Chet and Jean signed the necessary forms, and only then did Susan say what was on her mind. I know, Mr. Zuber, you're on the heart transplant list. I told him that he had the right to designate where any of her organs would go. I told him that he could receive Patty's heart. And this was a total shock to me. I'd never, ever considered it. No one in the family had ever considered it. Who would think of something like that? And a million things went through my mind. Is this right? Is this ethical? Can I stand the thought of every heartbeat reminding me of Patty? Is this a selfish move? And I says, no. I thought he was making a, a spur of the moment decision and that if he really thought about it, this is what Patty would have wanted. Disappointed, Susan began searching for another recipient for Patty's heart. Meanwhile, Chet spent some time alone with his thoughts, but he soon discovered that he wasn't alone. I had a long corridor to walk down to get to the area of the hospital where our room was in. While I was waiting for the elevator, now I, I don't want to sound corny here, but I swear it was Patty pleading with me to accept her heart. My God, I says, how can I explain to my family what had occurred to me at that elevator? He called me in and he said, you know, he, walking back, he thought that this is really what Patty would have wanted. The Zubers set off to find Susan, hoping it wouldn't be too late. But fortunately, her evaluation of Patty's heart had taken much longer than normal. It was unbelievable the kind of problems I encountered. We spent probably two or three hours just trying to get a picture of the heart. Normally, at that point in the process, I know I would have made one, at least two, calls. Based on the extra time that it took for me to evaluate Patty's heart, I'm sure that I would have already placed the heart with one of the recipients. Miraculously, the delay had bought Chet the time he needed to accept Patty's gift. At 3.56 a.m. on Monday, August 22nd, Patty Zuber's heart beat in her body for the last time. And less than six hours later, it began beating again inside the chest of her father. I woke up from surgery feeling well, and I've never had a bad day since. The rapid recovery was unbelievable. Boy, his skin was pink, his lips were colorful again, and he just did remarkably well after that. Patty's heart and spirit also live on in a special place on the farm. We have dedicated a park across the river here as Patty's Park. It's just a place to go and sit and be quiet. I believe in miracles more all the time. My faith is deeper. I always said that I would never get through it if I ever lost one of my kids. But you know what, I had an inner faith that came to me and, um, and I believe, you know, Patty watching over us. And I think that's what she really wanted. 
There's not a day goes by when I don't think about Patty. And there's not a day that goes by that somewhere in my prayers that I don't thank Patty for the gift that she has given me. I realize that if I had not accepted Patty's heart, I would have regretted that decision the rest of my life. Because it's truly a gift, a gift like no other. That I have experienced the greatest miracle, the sight of heaven. The spirit of Patty Zuber lives on in the lives of her father and mother, and they join us now from their home in Black River, Michigan. Hello, Jean. Chet. Hello, Richard. Hello, Richard. Thank you both for being on the show tonight. Chet, how are you feeling these days? I feel wonderful. Great. And Jean, how does it feel to have your husband healthy again? It's been great. We're able to travel and do things that we weren't able to do before. And I understand you travel quite a bit to talk about organ donation. We've been to many cities and um, organizations, medical conferences, um, trying to promote organ donation. Oh, well, that's wonderful. Chet, your daughter was a very giving person. I suppose you could say that what was once in her heart is now in yours. Is that why you're continuing to promote organ donation? Well, that's my goal, uh, Richard, to make people aware of the need and the importance for organ donation. Uh, there is no need for people today to die because of end-stage organ failure. Doctors today know how to successfully transplant organs. There are many medicines on the market that fight rejections. Post-transplant care is in place. Everything is in place but a necessary number of organs. You must be very proud of your daughter's decision to donate. We believe that as Patty looks back and down and sees all of the good that she has done, that Patty has to be the happiest little angel in heaven. What a shame that would have been to bury those organs. And what a blessing that that didn't happen. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having us.